Paul Armstrong, 19, factory hand. Lawrence Armstrong, 17, plumber's laborer. Ernest Mills, 19, factory hand. <laughs> it was March 14th, Sunday morning, and this was the end of an all-night binge. <laughs> At 7.30 on that same morning, Karen Latimer was on her way to church.
You got that report on Blake? Yes. Ah. So. Homicide, Detective Fraser. Did I get that right? Jeffrey Short? All right, send him in. Well, what's up? I'm just wondering what this chap could want. Is he a crim? He's a friend of the family. Your family? Yes. Well, answer the question. Is he a criminal? No. Good. Come in. How are you, Mr. Short? Oh, I can't complain, Rex. How are you? Pretty fit, thanks. Sit down. Oh, thanks. I didn't know you were on homicide. I've been here six months. Are they keeping you busy? Yes, they are. Oh, good. Well, I uh, suppose I better come to the point. On Sunday, I picked up a young girl. Now, wait a minute. Are you sure you've come to the right place? If you're in strife, see a lawyer. Oh, break it down, Rex. You know me better than that. Mr. Short, nothing would surprise me anymore. All right, well, what happened on Sunday morning? I was driving along Studley Park Road towards the city, and I saw this girl staggering along the footpath. Where exactly were you? Uh, near the old Dites Falls Road. Uh, I stopped the car and offered her a lift. She had a damn good look at me before she got in. Was she knocked about? Oh, her face and arms were bruised, her hair was all messed up, her, her stockings were torn, she was in a terrible mess. Did she say anything to you? No, she just asked me to drop her off at Punt Road. I, I was offered to take her to the police station, but she wouldn't have that. When was this, Mr. Short? Yeah, three days ago. I was wondering if I ought to have reported it. That's why I came to see you, Rex. Mm. This is Sergeant Bronson, Mr. Short. How do you do? Oh, pleased to meet you, Sergeant. Well, there's nothing much we can do about a thing like this, Mr. Short, unless we get a complaint from the girl or her parents. Oh, I see. We'll check with the Richmond police, but we'll probably find that nothing's come in. We know that a lot of these cases aren't reported. And the girl doesn't tell her parents, or if she does, they keep it quiet because they're frightened of the scandal. Oh, it's wrong. Yes. I'll tell you this. If a man assaulted my daughter, I'd kill him. Hello, Karen. Hello, Dad. What have you been doing all day? This. Is that the cloth your mother started? Yes. Do you like doing it? No. Well, it looks all right. Did you go out at all? We didn't need anything. Would you like to get the pictures tonight? You can't spend the rest of your life in this bastard house. I'm, I'm sorry, Karen. I saw them on the way home. The three of them. Going into the pub. Did they see you? Yes. They weren't worried. They knew damn well we wouldn't go to the police. I don't suppose this is the first time they've ever... Is Karen there, please? Who's speaking? Uh, Graham Dixon. Oh, oh. Just a moment, I'll get it. It's Graham. Now don't be stupid, Karen. Come on. I won't speak to him. No, look, he's a decent lad. You there, Graham? Uh, yes, Mr. Latimer. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I just came in the front door as the phone rang. I. Uh, you can't speak to Karen just now. She's, she's getting tea. Is anything wrong, Mr. Latimer? No, nothing's wrong. At lunchtime, I, I tried to ring her at the shop, but they told me she'd left there. Yes, yes, that's right. She got tired of that job. Has she got another one? No, uh, not yet. She's having a few days off. I see. Well, thanks, Mr. Latimer. I might ring her after tea. All right, Graham. Goodbye. 
I don't want to see him again. Uh, why not? I know you liked him. He doesn't have to know about it. You need never tell anyone. If he calls again, tell him I'm out. I'll get some tea in a minute. Don't worry about me. I'm going for a walk. It might have been better if we had gone to the police. No! All right, Karen. We decided. I know that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I shouldn't let those animals get away with it. some water on. Uh, I'll wash them under the tent. All right. Where's the tea towel? Brother in laundry. Dry? Yeah. Give you a good mix. You ain't got no manners. Is your brother worried about anything? He didn't hang himself. Was he worried about anything? 
No. He was happy. How long have you been living in Richmond? About a year. Why? Are your parents alive? Yeah. They live in Sydney. Is that where you come from? Yeah. What's your father's first name? So that we can notify him. John Armstrong, 497 Landy Street, Erskineville. Have you taken him down? Yes. You know anyone who might have done it? No, I can't think at all, so leave me alone. Now look, Paul. I don't know anybody who might have wanted to kill him. All right, Frank. We'll talk to him tomorrow. <laughs> One of them's got what he deserves. Homicide detectives believe the youth was murdered. Yes, very professional. A real hangman's noose. But Laurie Armstrong wasn't killed with it. Is that official? Yes. Pathologist says that he was killed with a much finer rope drawn across the centre of the neck. The larynx was broken. Hmm. If he'd been killed with that, the bruising would have been up around here. I suppose he was strung up to make it look like suicide. Seems likely. This fancy work doesn't make sense. Come in. I've got Paul Armstrong in here. Thanks, Rex. Excuse me, Jane. Get me Sergeant Harrison, please. But most of the time he knocked around with me and Ernie Mills. Address? 28 Henry Street, Richmond. He works at the factory, same as me. Why did you and Laurie come to Melbourne? To get away from our parents. Oh, yes. They're all right, but we went better on our own. Well, I'd say it hasn't turned out too well. Have you been mixed up in any brawls down here? Me? Well, have you? No. What about Laurie? He wasn't in trouble with anyone. It's true. Nobody was crook on him. Somebody killed him. Yeah. Do you want to help us, Paul? Yeah. If I knew anything, I'd tell you. Well, you've given us the, uh, the names of his mates. Now, what about girlfriends? Never had any. Do you know if he tried to take somebody else's? Didn't worry about women at all. And neither do I. Why did you mention that? Well, you seem to want to know everything. We're just trying to get a lead. Yeah, sure. Had you quarrelled with your brother? We never quarrelled. And that's the truth. Can I go now? Yeah. Have you been in touch with your parents? No. I might ring him tonight. Your father won't be able to come down for the funeral. He's ill. He's been ill for a month. Your mother won't want to leave him, so she probably won't come down either. Okay. I'll have to make arrangements for the funeral. What do I do? Just see an undertaker. He'll fix everything. There's a girl in it somewhere. Yes, but why is he holding back? Well, talk to Laurie's friends. Seven of them. And the one least likely to help is this workmate of Paul's. At 3.35 that afternoon, Paul Armstrong called at the factory where he and Ernest Mills were employed.
I, um, come in to get me wages. The funeral won't be till Monday morning. Who do you reckon done it? That bitch's father. Who do you mean? Karen Latimer's old man. She told him. How do you know? He went past Jesty when we was going into the pub. I see the way he looked at us. Have you told the police? Don't be stupid. If I tell them, we go up for rape. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah, and the damn car's out of action. You're wanted at the front office. Who wants me? Two detectives. The right, O Dixon. He'll be there in a second. I don't know why he was killed. He never had any blues, and he never worried about women. Got it. What was the matter with him? How do you mean? Was he scared of girls? No, he just didn't waste his time on them. And you don't either. That's right. A shy type, eh? You never saw Laurie Armstrong speak to a girl? Oh, I wouldn't say that. Why wouldn't you? Why balk at that? Up to now you've said anything that comes into your head. You're wrong there, Rex. You've been very careful, haven't you, Bills? I don't know what you're getting at. You don't want to help us, do you? Yes, I do. Laurie was me mate. Well, have you any idea who might have killed him? No. All right, you might as well go. Thanks. Mills, we'll be seeing you again tomorrow. Just in case you've remembered something. Sorry, Mum. No, I won't be home for dinner. We're working on. He's killed Ernie Mills. He's killed Ernie. I'll have to hang up. I'll call you later. I found him in the wash house, the same as Laurie. He says Mills is dead. He is dead, and I'll be next. Now listen, Armstrong. When you came in here, you said he's killed Ernie Mills. Who did you mean? You had someone in mind. Now, who was it? C can I sit down? Sit down. It was a bloke named Latimer. Where does he live? 
Smith Street, Richmond. It'd be about number 20. I'll get a signal to the wireless patrol. What's the story, Paul? Why do you think you're going to be killed? Last, Latimer's got a daughter. I think her name's Karen. Yes? Last Sunday morning, the three of us were in the car, and we saw her walking to church. What happened? Ernie got me to stop the car, and he said to Karen, don't go to church today. Come for a ride with us. She got in. No force was used? No. All right, where did you take her? I just drove anywhere for a while. And then the girl was in the back. They was whispering together. Yes. And then Ernie asked me to drop them off at Dites Falls. And did you do that? Yeah. And when they got out, Ernie said, wait for us, we won't be long. Go on, Armstrong. Laurie and me waited a while, and then Ernie come back on his own, and he said, she changed her mind, so I give her a good belt in the mouth and left her. Or where does her father come into it? She must have told him. Told him what? What could she possibly tell him that would make him want to kill you three? A lot of lies. You know what they're like. They're always putting blokes in. You'd been knocking around all night? Yeah. Had you been drinking? We had a few. This girl was on her way to church, but she preferred to go for a drive with you three? Yes! Hey, Sergeant. Wait in my office, Armstrong. Mills can wait as far as you're concerned. Go straight to the home of this man, Latimer. Your tea's ready. All right, Karen. If it's Graham Dixon again, tell him I've gone out. With another boy. Good evening, Mr. Latimer. Oh, hello, Graham. Uh, is Karen home? No, uh, no, she's she's gone out. Well, that's twice this week. Well, she's she's only young once, you know. Have I done anything to offend her? No, not at all. Are you sure? Well, she hasn't said anything to me. Of course, uh, she is keen on this other lad. I think it's best you should know that. What's his name? It would be just as well if I didn't tell you that. Well, you know, I think a lot of Karen. And, well, she's the one, Mr. Latimer. It'd suit me, Graham. You might put in a word for me, then, if you get the chance. Yes, all right. She might get tired of this other chap. Yes. Well, we'll see how it goes, eh? Well, I'll get along, Mr. Latimer. All right, Graham. Uh, give her my love. Goodbye. Good night, Graham. You'd never get a better lad than that. I don't want to talk about it. He'd marry you. Not if he knew. Yes. You ask him. You'll find out. No. Now look, Karen. All right. All right. Let, let's have tea. Oh, what does he want now? You start tea. I'll talk to him. Mr. Latimer? Yes? Away from homicide. Sergeant Bronson, Detective Fraser. And what's it about? May we come in? Yes, all right. We're investigating the death of Lawrence Armstrong. And the death of Ernest Mills. Was Mills murdered too? Yes. When? About an hour ago. Did you know these youths? I, I knew them by sight. I might have said good day a couple of times. Do you know Paul Armstrong? Yes. Have you a daughter named Karen? Yes. Mr. Latimer, we have reason to believe that on Sunday morning your daughter was in a car with Mills and the Armstrong brothers. That's a lie. How do you know? She wouldn't have had anything to do with them. Did she say anything about them to you? No. I didn't go out on Sunday morning. Oh, that's right. I, I'd forgotten. She usually goes to church. She didn't last Sunday. You're Karen Latimer. Yes. Paul Armstrong states that you were driven to Dites Falls. He must have gone out of his mind. Miss Latimer, on Sunday morning a motorist was in the vicinity of Dites Falls. 
Says he gave a lift to a girl who had been knocked about. It wasn't me. You have a bruise on your face, Miss Latimer. I tripped over some wood in the backyard on Saturday night. Yes, yes, that's right. That's why she didn't go to church. Where do you work, Mr. Latimer? In Cranston Knitting Mills, about 300 yards from here. What time did you knock off today? Half past four. What did you do then? You came straight home. He was here at 25 to 5 and he hasn't been out since. What about yesterday? I came home at the same time. And didn't go out. Well, that'll be all for now, Mr. Latimer. But we'll probably call and see you tomorrow. What for? Goodbye, Mr. Latimer. <laughs> It's uh, half past six, Frank. The others won't be there much longer, so you better get straight over. All right. Yeah? Karen Latimer denies being in your car Sunday. Of course she does. But you know better. I wouldn't make up a thing like that. She got in the car willingly? Yes. And at Dites Falls, she left the car with Mills? Yes. Willingly? Yes. And you and your brother stayed in the car? Yes. Well, what you say is true. It seems strange that your brother should have been killed first. If Latimer was avenging his daughter, I should have expected Mills to be the first victim. She must have told him we was all in it. And were you? No. Are you sure this wasn't rape? I, I don't know. I wasn't there. Ernie said he just slapped her face, but he might have been lying. What are you doing about Latimer? Well, he knows we're checking on him, so if he's determined to kill you, he'll make the attempt very soon. Well, what are you going to do about that? Oh, don't worry. We'll protect you. I'm not going back in that house. You won't have to. Sergeant Bronson and Detective Fraser are on their way there now. They'll stay there after the other police have gone and try to give the impression you're in the house. By yourself. <laughs> this light out, then go on up to the bedroom, pot around there for a while, put the light out and then sneak back in here. Shall do. startled me. I thought you were asleep. Where are you going, Dad? Just out on the veranda for a smoke. Why don't you go to bed? Yes, sir. I suppose you're right. I've got to be at work early in the morning. Good morning. I wasn't asleep. <laughs> if he's coming, it'll be in the next half hour before he goes to work. Oh, God, I'm tired and I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. Help yourself. <laughs> no, thanks. That was outside. Court. Graham Dixon on trial for murder. Oh, Ernie, come back to the Paul Armstrong giving evidence for the prosecution. We got in and we went back to Richmond. And what happened the day after this incident at Dites Falls? At half past twelve, Ernie and me went to a pub near the factory. Uh, my brother was there and the three of us had a counter lunch. We sat at one of the tables. What was said? 
Ernie told us what he'd done to Karen Latimer. And at the end of that conversation, did you notice something? Graham Dixon was sitting at the other table. I don't know how long he'd been there, but he was staring at us. Could he have heard what was said? Yeah, the other table's only three foot away. Thank you. We didn't even know he knew Karen. He doesn't live in Richmond. Thank you. What did Mills say at the hotel? He told us what, he, what had really happened. He said, I wasn't going to let a chicken out. I got tough. Armstrong, if someone had been listening to that conversation at the hotel, wouldn't it have been obvious that you, your brother and Mills had taken it in turns to criminally assault this unfortunate girl? No. I never put a hand on her, and neither did my brother. All right. I understand that Miss Latimer is also giving evidence for the Crown, so we'll see how that evidence compares with yours. Paul Armstrong punched me in the face, and I fell down. And uh, what happened then, Miss Latimer? You can lead on this. Oh, thank you. Miss Latimer, were you criminally assaulted? Yes. By whom? First, Paul Armstrong, then his brother, and then Mills. Thank you. Now, for how long had you known the accused, Graham Dixon? About four weeks. And uh, during that four weeks, how often had you seen him? I went out with him twice a week, and he came to the house a few times. Did you see Graham Dixon the day after this attack on you? Yes. He called in the evening, and I saw him through the window talking to my father. My father told him I'd gone to bed. Did you notice anything unusual in Dixon's manner? No. He just seemed his usual self. Dr. Samuels, an eminent psychiatrist, will give evidence suggesting that at the time these murders were committed, my client's mind had been so affected as to induce in him a state of insanity. He will also say that this state of mind was brought about by a conversation that my client heard in a Richmond hotel. Then Paul Armstrong said, I wonder if she'll go to church anymore. And that that all three of them laughed. And they were treating the whole thing as a joke. Yes. Now, do you remember something that Lawrence Armstrong said? He said, if she has a baby, how will we know which one of us is the father? And Mill said, we'll have to toss for it. Well, that kept them laughing for about two minutes. And for how long were they talking about this matter? Nearly half an hour. And the things they said, they were so foul that I... I... Yes, all right, Mr. Dixon. Now, prior to that day, what were your feelings towards Karen Latimer? I was very fond of her. And I thought that later on I might ask her to marry me. And did you go to her home on the Monday night? Yes. And when Mr Latimer told me she was in bed, I asked if I could speak to her for a few minutes. He said she was asleep, but I knew he was lying. I knew that because of what happened to her, she didn't want to see me. All right. Now, what did you do after you walked away from the house? got in the car and I sat there for about two hours. I knew she was awake. I knew she was suffering in her mind. And I knew that what had happened could affect her all her life. Now, had you formed any opinion regarding Mr. Latimer? Yeah. I could see he was upset. And I knew that he must know all about it. And I realised he had no intention of going to the police. Did you kill Lawrence Armstrong? Yes. Laurie Armstrong and Mills. I strangled them with a cord. And after you had killed Armstrong, did you put a rope around his neck and leave him suspended? I did that to both of them. Why, Mr. Dixon? I wanted to make the noose like an official hangman's rope. It wasn't murder, it was justice. Justice? Yes. Yeah. Were you attracted to Miss Latimer in the physical sense? Yes. Yeah. But you'd always had a respect for her. In point of fact, you wanted her to become your wife. That's right. Yeah. And then suddenly you learnt that she had been savagely degraded by three young men. And uh, when you heard them talking about it, did you hate them? Yes. You were filled with anger? Yes. Would you agree that it was the type of rage that any normal man would feel in such circumstances? Oh, I'd agree with that. So it wasn't a case of your believing that you were administering dispassionate justice, was it? You were motivated by anger, weren't you? I didn't kill him on the spur of the moment. I thought everything over. I waited three days, like a judge before he passes sentence. 
Why did you appoint yourself judge and executioner? If you felt that these men should be punished, why didn't you get Mr. Latimer to go to the police? I knew he wouldn't listen to me. You felt that a jail sentence would be inadequate? I knew that if they were arrested, they would lie and lie. I thought they might get off. So you decided to administer a punishment more terrible than that prescribed by law? They weren't human beings. I thought they ought to be destroyed, like mad dogs. Did you intend to kill Paul Armstrong as well? Yes. And if you had succeeded, would you then have gone to the police to give yourself up? No. So you didn't want to be caught? No. Is that another reason why you didn't tell Mr. Latimer that you knew all about the crime that these three men had committed? Yes. So before you killed Lawrence Armstrong, you had weighed all the pros and cons, hadn't you? Yes. I'm not claiming I was insane. I see. I knew what I was doing. I knew the risks I was taking. And I know the risks I'm taking now in giving you truthful answers. But I can't lie about this because I still believe that what I did was right. Well, it didn't work. They found him guilty of murder. Not insane within the meaning of the act, huh? That's it. And what do you think about it? Well, I'd go along with a verdict. But? Oh, I'm not happy with it. Dixon's not normal. No murder is normal. That's true. And you can't have people taking the law into their own hands, Sarge. That's right, Rex. It couldn't have happened if the father had made use of the law, if he'd reported the assault. No, oh, I suppose he felt that if the story got out, no man would want to marry his daughter. That's how they think. Oh, but surely he realised the girl's name would have been kept out of the papers? <laughs> What are we going to do about Graham? There's nothing. We just have to do. You should have made me go to the police. But you wouldn't hear of it. You should have made me. I'm sorry. Interstate artists choose to stay at California Motel, Melbourne. They fly the friendly way with TAA, the nation's jet line. 